Well, thank you very much. I am Pythagorana Geometressa, and uh, welcome to Geometry Shrine of the Divine. Um, I started working on this presentation October 26th, and I've been really working on it daily, sort of polishing it and burnishing it and getting it to so it, it, it gleams and it's been a really interesting, a very satisfying uh, process. Uh, so first of all, I just have to uh, thank you for being my friends. So grateful for having the kind of friends that would allow me to do something like this, that would be interested in coming to something like this. Um, just, just the kind of friends I, I need. So, so thank you very much for, for your love and support. Um, you might say that this is the, the culmination of my own personal quest to give myself my own PhD, uh, which I started when I, I first met Kayleen. Uh, I, what I really appreciate about this opportunity is it, it's a targeted response. So it's a, a finite topic to, to some extent, although it really is a, a very large topic, but it allows me to kind of hone in on, on some things. If somebody said, Nancy, you talked to us about sacred geometry, I'd be like, yeah, you have seven months, uh, where, do I, where do I begin? So this allowed me to find a place where I could actually um, begin and it makes it a lot more, more manageable. Um, you know, I have been on this journey with sacred geometry for four years now, four years, and I just can't get enough of it. I, I absolutely love it, everything about it. Um, so, of course, you know, I've, I've been reading many, many books, uh, but when you have to explain something to somebody else, then you really learn it. And so I, I really appreciate it in, in that uh, sense. Um, you know, this is not a geometry lesson. Uh, this is what I'd call metageometry. Um, it's really more about um, the, the philosophy of the geometry than the geometry itself. But as I went through and I started creating pr the presentation, I thought, oh, they won't like that if I don't actually show them some geometry or show them some art. So I, find, I, I managed to find a way uh, to come up with some, some concrete uh, examples, um, as well as examples of my own artwork so I could you know, demonstrate to you what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, so this is you, this group of people is my beta test. Uh, this is the first time I'm, I'm doing this. I like it to be 75 minutes and hopefully I can craft it so it'll be about that. I do have 40 slides uh, to present. So you might find me um, kind of rushing at times. Um, and then we'll, you know, leave, hopefully have some time. At the, at the... What's that? Um, Ask everyone to mute themselves, if you would, please. Okay. Maybe everybody could mute themselves. I'm not sure what that sound was. So, okay. So here we go. Geometry, Shrine of the Divine. Um, in a very important work uh, by Plato, the, the Timaeus, he starts off and, and he says, uh, don't ever start any endeavor without invoking the gods. So I thought, well, that, that, that really needs to be what I do on, um, on page one. And you'll see a picture here of one of the modern day sages and the great lineage of, of geometers. Uh, it's uh, Mr. Keith Critchlow, uh, who died in April, 2020 of uh, natural causes. Um, he is the founder of the Prince's School of Traditional uh, Arts, and uh, which I've benefited greatly from, particularly in the Zoom era, where I couldn't always be running over to London, but in, I could benefit from a lot of things um, during the Zoom era. And what every time they start one of the uh, sessions at the Prince's School, they start with, with these words, may we be guided by truth, May beauty be revealed to us and may it result in goodness for all. And um, 
you know, these are, are thoroughly platonic concepts. And of course, I'll be talking about platonic concepts a, a lot here. Keith actually, you know, people like, like us uh, that are geometers, um, we don't really know what to, what to call ourselves. And uh, Keith came up with a term, he called himself a pattern seeker. And I think that that's a really, uh, a really good description. Um, he left a lot of descendants behind, the people that offer classes at the school. I've had a benefit to hear their talks and a lot of people, he left, a, certainly left a lot of good in the world and a lot of people who still honor him with their words and their their work. Um, I have, you know, taken all these classes at the Princess School and now there's a basically an international community of geometers on in Instagram who support each other and get to know each other. And that's been really, really a, a real, real joy. If you wanted to hear more about Keith, I actually have an article about his life that was written. I'd be happy to share. Um, so why did I entitle this lecture Shrine of the Divine? When it, when it came to me, I thought that, that I had a perfect name for it. Um, so Plato's work, uh, Timaeus, is a foundational work in pl Platonic thinking. Uh, and actually, um, I have devoted a lot of this last year trying to understand it, reading commentaries on it and really digging into it. It's the main work where he lays out uh, about um, geometry and numbers as part of a, a, a cosmogony, a creation story. And this presentation is named after a really beautiful phrase from the Timaeus, ton aideon theon gegonos adalma, meaning basically for the eternal gods is born the shrine of the cosmos. The created cosmos is a shrine brought into being for the ever, everlasting gods. So this concept uh, really kind of kind of grabbed me and I said, that's it, that's a perfect, perfect uh, name for it. Um, uh, the, the Timaeus is a cosmogonic creation myth that uses geometric and numerical concepts to talk about the beauty and the harmony of creation. And you might say that the divine delegated to the demiurge, the divine craftsman, um, the, the, the uh, mission of the creation of beauty and the creation of the soul in the universe. And uh, the demiurge knows math. Um, so, you know, as human beings, it is our nature to believe that there is a beginning and an end to look for stories that tell us where we come from, what our, what our beginning is. Uh, and you see in this, this word here, the gegonos. Gegonos is, is related to ginesthai, related to Genesis. And in Greek, it really means more, more than just beginning, but, but to be brought into being, to become. Um, and uh, Plato uses the, the term in the Timaeus, which I, is a kind of fundamental to all the things that I'll be saying here. He, he uses the term ton aikotes mython, meaning the likely story. So in other words, he, he doesn't believe that this is really the way that the universe was created, but this is a likely story. So, so try to learn from it in, in that uh, sense. I included on this slide here, uh, a picture from my uh, mentor, uh, Mark Reynolds. Uh, and this particular piece is, was done uh, in 2016, it's called Tulpa. And I thought this is a perfect concept that the definition of a Tulpa uh, is a being or object which is created through mental or spiritual powers. And that is, has a lot to do with uh, what, I'm, what I'll be talking about. So the um, second word in, in the, um, the, the phrase about the shrine of the divine that's used in Greek is, um, oops, is the word agalma. Um, in in uh, 
Agama was a captivating word that I first learned in uh, Walter Burkert's important work on Greek religion, which I really love. I love learning about the culture of ancient Greece. I'm a Grecophile, all the fascinating re uh, religious practices and, and rituals. Um, and Burkert discusses all the practices of ancient Minoan Mycenaean um, age. Uh, rituals of, of sacrifice, of libation, rituals of purification, uh, describing the great temples at Olympia, at uh, Delos, Delphi, the Acropolis, discussing priesthood, uh, the notion of sanctuary, oracles, the festivals. And this one word that, that Burkert introduced to me then was agama. And agama is, the definition of that is a, a statue or an object in which one takes delight. And Plato and his uh, disciple, later disciple Proclus also used this concept of agama. And agama is an object that is saturated with divine energy. These are objects that were considered to receive the transcendent essence of the gods. And um, you might say that uh, the whole cosmos is filled with the divinity of the intel intelligible gods. So what, what object is more saturated with divine energy than the cosmos? Um, and so it's the, the cosmos is, is the, the holiest of shrines. The cosmos is the imago Dei, the image of God. And for me, geometry is very much an agama, a, an object, although it's not an object, an object that's saturated with, with divine energy. Um, there's one thinker, a Neoplatonic thinker, his name is Algis Ujdavinish. He's a, a Lithuanian uh, Neoplatonist philosopher. And, and he says, well, names, words, symbols, can also be a galma, um, that, that things that receive a trans transcendent essence into them and that this, this basically emanates from the gods. Um, this is one of my recent works and I, I think that um, this is, might be an example of an agalma, a construction that a place where the divine appears. Uh, this particular work that I did is called Xanadu, and it happens to be based on the beauty found within the three-four relationship, where there's um, six squares on the bottom and eight up the top, eight up the top, and then all these fantastic relationships can be found there. Um, and so I felt that this is kind of a, a good example of. Um, beauty, wonder, uh, order, pattern, and mystery. And then I, the, the one in the center was the, the piece that I created. And then I tessellated it and joined it with itself. And you see it creates all these fantastic patterns uh, that I, I um, wouldn't even have predicted uh, it went before the tessellation. So when I was asking myself, okay, how am I gonna organize this presentation? I had an aha moment. I'm gonna organize this around beautiful Greek words. Beautiful Greek words will help me explain my ideas. And I have always loved words. A um, Couple of good words for people who love words are logophilia or philologos, but you might even say I have logomania. Um, you know, I, I just, I love words. Plato even said the words are the horses of the mind. Um, when I was little, one of my favorite subjects in, in school was vocabulary. And I remember my mother got me a book called Wally the Word Worm by Clifton Fadiman. And that was when I first learned words like palindromes and syzygy and sesquipedalian. And, and I just loved it. Um, one very important writer and thinker in the field of sacred geometry is, is a man uh, who, whose uh, name is Robert Lawler. He wrote the introduction to a book on, of, uh, by Theon of Smyrna. 
um, who's also a really important commentary on the, the Tanaeus. And Lawler said something that really appealed to me, which is that the Greek language itself is better able to embrace philosophy and ideas. So let's accept that notion um, for, for the time being. He, he suggests that the Greek language itself is a more spiritual language than English. Uh, he asserts that, that the English language is a language of, of things. And the example he gives is the word mesotes, mesos, which translates as mean or median. And of course, when we think of the word mean, uh, we think of something that is the average, the arithmetic mean, something that occupies a middle position. Um, but in Greek, the word mean has a, a more a different meaning, a more, richer meaning. Uh, it stands more for equipoise than, you know, an average. You might say the mean is an unseen fulcrum that balances observable polarities, thereby joining the pieces, connoting the physical necessity of a unifying agent or a first cause. Uh, so I also thought that because the concepts that I'm trying to um, convey are sort of maybe or out of the ordinary that using Greek words to talk about, talk about it also allows us to sort of break out of common everyday language and to use a more of a hieratic or a sacred language to, to, to communicate about it. Um, so of course, the first word that I came up with, I had to invent a word here, which is Pythagon, wait a minute, Pythagonogenesis. Uh, so how did I become Pythagorean? And I remember I, I uh, posted on Facebook one day, several years ago, I, I, I said, oh my God, I think I'm becoming a Pythagorean. And a, a friend of mine said, I always suspected it. Um, so really, uh, I came to one rainy day in January 2017, I came to a lecture in Petaluma that Kayleen was giving. She was talking about uh, Pythagoras that day. And I was like, I loved every minute, every minute of that. Um, it was fascinating to me. And there was lying there on her table, a book called Constructing the Universe um, by a man named Michael Schneider. And so I went home, I purchased that and, um, and I haven't looked back since. I read that book, I ate it up really. You know, it's like, oh, there's so much here and I am going down this, this path. Um, I have always been, um, you know, in interested in history. Uh, I'm fascinated with ancient history in particular. I'm fascinated with people long, long ago, you know, trying to figure things out as best as they could, given the science of the time and dealing with the mystery of life. Uh, to me, uh, as my life path unfolds, lots of different things happen, but there's also a continuity in a, in a way between things I've, I've done with my life. And one thing about geometry is that's so appealing to me, it's, it's everything. It's art, it's math, it's architecture, it's philosophy, it's ritual, it's a spiritual discipline, it's, it's, it's everything. And, um, you know, despite the fact that I was a religious studies major and I really love the arts and literature and things like that, I also know my math and, and I was also, you know, always in advanced math classes and took advanced placement in math and I went on and got my MBA and, you know, I, I, uh, I do, I do math. Um, and so that, you know, I don't take a very mathy approach uh, to, to this, but, you know, it's the, the structure uh, that, that really appeals, appeals to me. Um, the word mastery is one of the words I, I really love and is something that I myself seek. Um, I don't want to just read things. I want to really know them and understand them especially with something that's so captivating uh, to me as, uh, as geometry. So I do seek 
I do seek mastery. Um, you know, there's two, two beautiful words, maestro and magister, you know, ra rather than thinking of mastery as sort of like, the, the, that's the more beautiful way of, to relate to that word. Um, and I'm pleased to find, find that I have found community, people like me, people also Platonists. Um, you know, I met Mark Reynolds, uh, through Kayleen and I did the art show Women in the Search for Wisdom. And through that, met a woman who introduced me to Mark and he became my teacher. Uh, he had taught geometry to art students for 25 years. Uh, then he was retired, but he still wanted to keep his finger in the uh, pot and um, took me on as his apprentice, really. And we now talk to each other every day, mostly by text message. Um, and we're just partners in this search because we both have, you know, we, he's, he's more far gone than me <laughs> with geometry. He's been doing it for his whole life. Uh, but also finding community through um, the Prince's School and the Temenos Academy in, in Britain. So I would ask, uh, answer the question, um, what is sacred geometry? What is it to me? Because it means a lot of different things uh, to a lot of people. And you will not hear me saying anything about proofs. Um, they have their own place and beauty, for, but, but to me, uh, it's not what we probably, most of us, if we took geometry in high school or college, it's, it's not like that. Um, I'm not into crop circles. I'm not into swinging crystals or anything like that. To me, geometry is uh, more of a philosophy. And actually, Mark, neither Mark nor I really like calling it sacred geometry. Um, we like to call it uh, contemplative geometry or philosophical geometry. Um, so there is contained in it is this notion of this a type of a discipline where you align and direct the mind towards abstract universal truths. Um, I included here a quotation from a great John Michel who has passed away. Mark knew him and he said he smoked himself to death, which was Silly, but um, what, what John Michel said is numerical studies philosophically directed lead the mind into a world of abstract order and towards a state of understanding that the Greeks call nous or divine intelligence. So this is really how I think of geometry. Geometry is a vehicle and a discipline for both spiritual and intellectual insight. Um, one concept that, that often comes up in uh, talking about Neoplatonism is the idea of the golden chain, cruce seire. And uh, what, what this really refers to is a kind of a lineage of ideas that goes all the way back. Um, the perennial philosophy is another phrase that's, that's used. Um, that it basically uh, in, in Pythagoras, in Plato, in Plotinus, in Proclus, some of the, the, the great Platonic thinkers, there are timeless universal truths present in all religions. And that's something that I, I believe really, really strongly. Um, a great word is paradosis, handing down traditions. And geometry is certainly such a thing. Um, certainly you see mysticism and geometry in, in virtually all religious and artistic traditions. Um, and obviously astronomy being a very, very important uh, science, um, you know, the, the circle, the sphere, cardinal directions are, are just right there at the heart of when we look up into the universe and see what we see. Um, Greek philosophy and Greek mathematics was, I think, a point in human evolution, actually, that where we started going into the realm of idols, of the realm of ideas. And to me, this is the greatness of, of being human. The greatness of being human is that 
we see things that are invisible. And um, so that's kind of at, at, the, at the root of my, my fascination with, with geometry. Um, I have a deep respect for ancestors uh, and really, you know, we, we are not cleverer and more intelligent than, than people in, in, the, in the past. They, they were really trying to understand and to a great extent, they did a very good job of putting things together. And ancient thought is, is not primitive thought. And I, I just, um, I learned a, um, a new word came up in my Merriam-Webster word of the day, which was filiopietistic. Filiopietistic means excess veneration of, of ancestors and traditions. So um, I should, uh, though I really do uh, love going back and, and learning from the ancient uh, ancestors, uh, I will try to avoid being filiopietistic uh, about it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk more uh, later about my encounter with an artist and a speaker at the Princess School named David Cranswick, but uh, he defines creativity as engaging with traditions that are already there. And so there's a kind of a non egoic view of creativity that that you're 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 engaging with things that have been passed down for ages um, one of the biggest uh, influences on things i've read in recent years was a man named mahali chiksit mahali and um that is a uh, hungarian name and i'm sure i'm not pronouncing it correctly he died like three weeks ago but he wrote a book uh, called Flow. Uh, actually, he died on October 20th. Uh, and the, this book Flow basically talks about a level of concentration in which outside stimuli or even time itself seems to fall away. And I certainly, for, for me working with geometry, I can very much relate to that. Um, he did a survey and asked people, you know, when, when they're happier, are you happier when you're working or you're happier when you're relaxing? And it really turns out that people were happier when they were working, uh, if it was the right kind of work. In other words, work that matched skill level with, with challenge. And they, they experienced this kind of timelessness. Um, even, you know, very similar to a mystical state. Um, I read the work of a, of a doctor named Dr. Andrew Newberg, who talks about why God won't go away, that the brain is constructed in, in this way to, to be receptive to uh, and open to, to mystical ex experience. And you might call it, say, the, the brain on God. Uh, the, that the brain being, you know, totally, totally unified um, with the the object of its its attention. So, I ask the question: Who put who put the sacred and sacred geometry? This is sort of like who who put the ram and the ramalama ding dong? Um, and I, I kind of I'll, I'll stay away from saying a lot of, of, of assertions, but I, this, this I would say is, is an, an assertion um, that the creator has made an ordered and sacred world, and this is obvious. Uh, that to me, that's, that's how I, I see it. Uh, it's not a matter of, do I believe in God? This is, this is not something that you break down in that way you believe or not, but it's obvious that we live in a beautiful ordered universe. Um, I included here a, um, a uh, quotation from, hang on, I'm having trouble with this thing. A quotation from my, uh, my uh, hero, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Is it not better to intimate our astonishment as we pass through this world? I will lift up my hands and say, Cosmos. So indeed, here, here, uh, 
Waldo, in, indeed, um, that's the same thing that, that I experience. Um, you know, you, we look around and we see just, just like the, this, the, the recognition that there's beauty in nature, art and music, this filled the Pythagoreans with awe and it gave rise to the belief in the mystical power of, of number. Uh, and by number, I really mean things we see, have number in things we hear, things we understand. Number is in all those things and number is indeed beautiful and fundamental. Um, human consciousness or mind, I love that, that word always have, gives way to divinity and for the sacred to appear. We are made to see God. Geometry is a pathway to seeing invisible things. And I keep coming back to this, things that are invisible. I find that very, very compelling. A, a quotation here from Robert Lawler, within the human consciousness is the unique ability to perceive the transparency between absolute permanent relationships contained in the insubstantial forms of a geometric order and the changing forms of the actual world. Um, one word that I've encountered um, throughout my studies is the great word called theodidactos. And theodidactos basically means taught by God. So who's your teacher? God, of, of course. You, you're getting this, this stuff kind of straight from from the, the source and the deeper you get into it, um, you really um, start to uncover these things that God left out for us. Um, and uh, one of the, the, the words that's, that, that I think is a better description than sacred geometry is again, this Greek word, hieratike techne. And hieros means sacred, and techne means art. Uh, and I'll talk about that more a little bit later. But, you know, the, the fact that art is in Greek, the word is techne, it has to do with a craft, a thing that you do with your hands. Uh, so there's this, this uh, combination of things there. Um, a lot of uh, Neoplatonist thought talks about the concept of uh, theurgy. Theurgy means God work, and it is a, a priestly art, but the belief is that uh, it's really things that are accomplished by the gods, opening yourself so that these uh, lessons and this beauty uh, comes forth and, and comes uh, through you. Uh, the you know, ancient Greeks, uh, you know, particularly Neoplatonists, thought uh, talked about the degrees of initiation, transformation, and then elevation. Um, there's a, a, a great word uh, called anagogy, on, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. But it's it's it represents an ascending path towards unification with the on one through scientific training, through symbols, through sacred rites, through divine names, theurgic powers. Um, so one of the best words of all, the word logos. Um, and here I, I put it in, in the, the Greek um, letters. Um, actually, uh, you know, there, there's the, the phrase from, from the Bible, uh, in, pripi, in, pricio, in principio erat verbum, in the beginning was the word, logos. And it was a, um, I think originally Heraclitus used the word, he was a pre-Socratic, um, but it was also used by Plotinus and, and Augustine, uh, referring to the one or the spirit. And actually even Carl Jung uses this, this concept of, of logos. So how should we understand what that is? It's not just how we communicate with, with words, but it is the universal mind and reality behind words. 
um, universal divine reason that is imminent in nature and yet transcends all oppositions in the cosmos. It is a unifying and liberating revelatory force with which reconciles the human with the divine. And that is the important part of it, reconciling the human with the divine. It links man, if you'll pardon an expression, to the divine prototype, which is the logos. Um, and it, it refers really to human reason as well as this universal divine intelligence that's revealed through the cosmos to humankind. And certainly for those of us that are familiar with the biblical usage of, of Lagos, that it's a similarity there. God's desire and ability to speak to the human. It points out the union between the human and, and the divine. Um, according to, to Plato, Logos has four meanings, mental thought with no words, explanation of the elements of the universe, uh, of the universe, a ratio of proportion, and I'll talk more about proportion, comparing things of the same species, can have, uh, discerning relationships of things to each other, and also just beautiful, beautiful words. Uh, a number is uh, fundamental to the starting point to break down logos in the world, a point of understanding. So on this page, I almost wanted to put on here anthropos, but it wasn't quite exactly the right word that I was looking for. I think the word I'm really looking for is psyche, or tsuke, I guess you say. And, and, Psyche is really, really soul. And in platonic thinking, to be human is to possess soul. Uh, this particular picture here, we talk a lot about the vesica piscis, the union of two circles. You see that in the, the right, right side there. The vesica piscis perfectly uh, captures, is a diagram that really perfectly captures the idea of uh, heaven, and earth unite in man, which is spirit. So we look up to the heavens, we look up to things eternal, and yet we are also grounded on, on the earth. So it's this intermediary zone, this marriage of, of uh, matter and spirit. Um, uh, you know, this, this, this is a concept that kind of perfectly, perfectly describes that, that the soul is an interme intermediary. It looks both ways. There is a, something in Neoplatonic thinking called the triadic principle. The soul abides in the divine. It proceeds from the divine and it returns to the divine. So this, and in the, um, very uh, symbolically, this intersection of two circles is where we find an equilateral triangle, which is the perfect uh, symbol of three, as well as uh, the, the square root of three, a very important number. Uh, one really cool word uh, in Platonic thinking is methexis, participation. And think of it in that we participate by our nature by the virtue of the way our minds are made, or that our, our souls are made, we participate in the, in the divine. And that is what soul is. And soul, just like the cosmos, follows similar laws and harmonies. Um, one really wonderful word that we see over and over again is noesis. And, um, uh, you know, P Plato is undeniably very hierarchical. <laughs> there are some things that are higher and some things that are, are lower, some things are better and some things that are worse. And, and um, so I, I go back to something that my mother always used to say to me, good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. And uh, so this, this, I think this analogy here uh, called the analogy of the divided line is, is very much like that. He says that 
Uh, this is ca called the, the ladder of knowing. How does the mind work? And it's divided into, into four parts. And you can see the last part, noesis, the highest part is bigger than the rest. Uh, first, we have um, aesthesis, sensation. Uh, then we have uh, opinion or faith. Then we have dianoia, which is discursive reasoning. So it's it's reason, it uses logos, but noesis is, is more of this uh, understanding of um, um, pl a place where you achieve certainty, uh, a place where you, it's a different mode of knowing actually. It's, it's more a mode that, that gets into e uh, even a archetypal realm. Okay, this slide actually is, uh, is, is pretty rich. So geometry, of course, uh, comes from, you know, the word for earth and measure. And um, so geometry is earth measure. Um, and you might say that geometry is number operating in space. Uh, music is number operating in, in time. Um, so number really op operates in, in many different ways. Now, earth measure, of course, I could, I could go into the way that the early Egyptians and, and Babylonians, you know, would use geometry to measure the earth, literally surveying. Uh, they called them the, the harpodinopti, the rope stretchers. They would take a rope and find ways to, to measure. But um, I think geometry really I would like a definition of, it's more than just earth measure. Uh, geometry comes from the heavens. Geometry comes when we look up and we see this big sphere above us. We see these patterns, we see the planets moving. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, I think it causes mankind to start to ask some of the most important fundamental questions. Um, you know, we wake up in the morning, we notice the sun sets, uh, comes, rises in the east and sets in, in the west. Um, time itself necess necessitates geometry. We have the tides, the seasons, breathing, circular patterns, clocks, calendars, our bio clocks, this time keeping power of life, so waking, sleeping. And when you think about it, the, the rhythms of body chemistry are cyclically orchestrated with geophysical and celestial periodicity. So it's, you know, all, everything happening in the universe is happening to us when we breathe and we, and we, we sleep. And the slightest change in any of it would actually destroy the religion, uh, the, the rhythms of life. Uh, geometry, it, it was also uh, traditionally um, necessary for religious observance. So, um, you know, we had to align certain religious holidays with the, with the movement of the, of the moon and the sun. Uh, Easter was the first Sunday after the first full moon following the spring equinox. Well, they didn't have, you know, Apple calendars back then. So they had to, you know, really make some close observations of, of the heavens. Um, on the left of this slide here, you see some Arab kind of scribbles, uh, um, a diagram and, and, um, what I learned was early Arab astronomers, they looked up and they saw star groups and they called them lunar mansions and they later became the, the constellations. So you see here, you know, early attempts to start to kind of say, what is going on up there in, in, the, in the stars? And um, understandably, the, the, a lot of the Arab cultures were ahead in, in observing the, the heavens. And what I learned was that uh, it was so hot, they were adventurous and exploring lots of places. And um, it, it was so hot that they were forced to travel at night. So of course they had to get really good at, at uh, geometry. Um, in, in, you know, nature itself is, is a beautiful uh, symbol 
if you think of nature as a symbol, of course, it's more than that. But but the earth itself is a tremendous uh, metaphysical uh, analogy and, um, you know, a great metaphor talking about the likely story. We can get so far just by contemplating the way the earth moves and um the early medieval universe was essentially platonic based on a spherical notion of the, the universe and guided by a creator that created a beautiful ordered universe. Uh, you might say once upon a time, the universe had meaning and it was tightly structured around a hierarchical system centered around the earth and the, the role of the human race in that. So at every level, was a satisfying metaphor for, for God. Again, just as to me, geometry is a very satisfying metaphor for, for God. Um, and all of these um, symbolic messages carry with them metaphysical analogies. Uh, Plato talked about the platonic solids, the, the cube, the icosahedron, tetrahedron, dodecahedron, um, as, as uh, being metaphors for the four elements and as well as, um, as, well as, as God. Um, and of course, sphericity in itself, I, I, I wanted to have a quote here from C.S. Lewis, who's a, a really interesting thinker. Uh, he had a, this is a quotation from the discarded image the discarded image, an introduction to medieval and Renaissance literature. The spheres of the old present us with, a, with an object in which the mind can rest, overwhelming in its greatness, but satisfying in its harmony. I just thought that was a really beautiful quotation. Um, oh, so, sorry, on this one here, I, I, I included uh, a picture uh, from, it's a depiction of, of the myth of Ur. This is called the spindle of necessity. And it was a, a, a view of the universe that all of the planets and the sun and the moon were kind of whirring around this, this one spindle and were in harmonic relation to each other, uh, which is a very, very wonderful image. Uh, there's something called the Somnium Scipionis, which is the dream of Cicero. And in this, Cicero, uh, excuse me, Scipio has a dream where he sees a universe made of nine celestial spheres. And when he looks up at the universe, he starts to hear a sound so great and sweet. Tantus et tam dulcis. Um, this is something which is the, the inscription which is on the door over Plato's Academy, which is Agiometritos Medeis Isiton, which basically means let none ignorant of geometry come under my roof. And I thought, well, that would be a funny thing to put on my, my front door to say, uh, <laughs> if you don't know geometry, <laughs> stay away. Agiometritos. And, um, the, you know, in, in Greek, if you put an A in front of something, it means not. So are you ageometric? Um, so I just thought that was a, a, a funny, funny thing. Um, my next slide, I, 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 I sort of wanted to put the word paideia in. Uh, which of course is related to pedagogy or, or learning, but really paideia in Greek is, is not what I was getting at, although it's not a bad idea either. Paideia was a path of, of education or necessary to create good citizens. Um, and it was more about education versus learnedness. Um, learning uh, is, is is more the the better word for it is manthanon, manthanon, um, and as you might remember, I I read a, there's 147 Delphic maxims, and I I read one every morning, and someday I'll probably remember them. But one of them is manthanon mekalme, which is never tire of learning. Um, so because why? 
because learning takes us higher. Um, and that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Um, Mark and I have befriended on Instagram a very young Muslim woman from a little island in East Java, Indonesia. And we said she should buy the book by Michael Schneider. And she said she couldn't because it would take her a whole month's salary. And we were like, oh, you bet she loves geometry like we do. So we go back and forth with her and we send her things and different lessons. And she's a beautiful soul. It's just really wonder. But Medina came up with this. We sent her something and she said her English is spotty. But she said, this form hugs me and makes me fall in a deep learning. And I thought, oh, that is so beautiful. It makes me fall in a deep learning. Um, and, you know, the, the word mathematics itself means learning. Mathema means what one learns. It's a unit of learning, so to, so to speak. So it's, it's particularly wonderful that uh, mathema is, is related to mathematics. The early Pythagoreans, uh, as they went through their stages of initiation, um, they would advance from being akusmatikoi, akusma, those who hear the lessons versus the mathematikoi those who have achieved a higher degree uh, in Pythagore Pythagorean learning. Um, one of the uh, beautiful concepts I've encountered is the concept of propaedeutics. And propaedeutics uh, is an area of study, this is according to Plato, an area of study serving as a preliminary instruction instruction or introduction to further study. And Plato admonished his students to study geometry as a propaedeuticon for the mind, as a means of purifying an exercise in pure thought. Thought, which is an inner exercise that stresses invariant relationships under various geometric transformations. Um, thought, which lifts the soul from the mundane world to a non-spatial archetypal realm. I included on this page here a picture. This is a classic um, thing in uh, Platonism, which is called the Delian problem. So it, it has to do with um, if you see the blue square in the, in the corner, you say, well, I would like to learn how to create a square that is actually double the area of that square. Well, if I multiplied each side by, you know, by, by two, I would get something that's four times as large. And, and apparently in the Meno, uh, Plato asked a slave boy who was not schooled to figure this, this out. And he came up with the idea of when you create a square whose sides are equal to the diagonal of the first square, you will double the square. So this is a perfect example of a propedeuticon. And once you see that, you're on your way to infinity uh, with the power of, of a, the explanatory power of a diagonal in, and in, in growth. Um, so really, there's a view that, that geometry or mathematics is a kind of a, a, a purification. Um, it, it allows us to occupy the spirit with intelligible things that have true existence and ideas to understand the cosmos, to understand what is above and the celestial harmonies. Um, the, there's a notion of which I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with of the quadrivium, um, the, the fourfold way that, that uh, studying the, the mathematical sciences, arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy are good ways to, to build, build the spirit. Um, there, there's a German word, Bildung, which means education in, in German, but this concept was used particularly by Goethe and the, the Romantics, uh, and it's really a deeper concept than just education. It really means um, self-development to enable the mind to receive the cosmic life of the heavens, to align ourselves with some kind of a 
a universal order. And Goethe, uh, someday I'd like to read a lot more um, about him, but not only did he write great poetry and, and Faust and things like that, but he was also very much of a, of a scientist and he considered building to be a mode of study in which the investigator actually unites with the objects investigated, which is something I can very much uh, relate to. Uh, Goethe said, every new object well contemplated opens up a new organ within us. And I just love that idea that, that, that a new organ, a new way of understanding is, is opened up. Um, I'll put here that the next word is this, this word anagoge. Anagoge means to lead up. Uh, to Anagoge means elevation, spiritual or mystical enlightenment. Um, and so I, I think of geometry for me as anagogy. Uh, oh, you're getting, getting higher and higher. You're getting closer and closer. You're seeing these beautiful things. You're seeing how things fit together and you're you know, just, just amazed at it. Um, telos, uh, you've probably heard of you know, the teleological, the, word te the, the telos meaning aim or goal, uh, but telos also means to make perfect or to go higher. The, this term to lay in, to consecrate, to initiate, to make it perfect. And by perfect, used in, not in the sense of without flaws, but meaning whole or complete. Um, and I feel that, um, you know, for, for me, geometry is, is just that. It allows you to participate in the creative energies of the, of the gods. Um, really wonderful, wonderful words. Epiphany and apokteia. Apopteia particularly, apopteia means in Neoplatonic thinking, uh, beholding the secret symbols or epiphanies of the gods. Uh, in other words, achieving a kind of a state in which you can see these, these, these symbols, the way that numbers have created the universe. Uh, geometry gives us a glimpse, gives me a glimpse uh, into the, the essence and the, the workings of, of the divine. I showed you earlier um, uh, when I was talking about Agalma, my, my work on Z Xanadu. And I would say for me, Xanadu resulted in almost geometric paralysis. I think I've got to come up with a new disorder because, and this is a picture um, of that, that relates to that that I'm working on now an incomplete artwork. But when I look at this, I can't move. I really can't move. And I could probably explain to you why it's so cool, all the things that are revealed in this. And I won't get into that. It would, it would take a little while. Um, but to me, that, that is what I call apopteia. Um, in, in Greek mystery religions, Apopteia was the important mystical vision that culminated at the end of the Eleusinian mysteries in which you, you behold the secret symbols or epiphanies of the God and Apopteia was seen to be the highest stage of initiation. Um, philosophical purification and instruction results in Apoptika. Culminates in Apoptika, the direct revelation of truth and contemplation of the forms or divine realities. Um, epiphany, I could go on and on. What a what a what a beautiful word! And I, I can honestly say that I've had geometric epiphanies. What is an epiphany to me? An epiphany is when, in a moment, things make total sense. Uh, the, this, this notion of the moment actually comes up in uh, the romantic poets, Coleridge and, and Wordsworth. And it's not a, a question of sequential steps in a line of reasoning, but rather an instant of recognition of pure intuition, which carries with it its own weight of conviction. And that 
phrase I really like that 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 it's not a matter of like you know sequential sequential thinking is that suddenly it fits together and it's perfectly clear it carries with it its own weight of conviction it's a eureka moment um, a moment of revelation and breakthrough and understanding uh, and and for me it's it's I can relate because sometimes I'm like oh gosh this is so hard oh, I'm so much struggling with this. And you struggle and you work and you struggle and you work and then suddenly I get it and I have it and it's, it's, it's mine. Um, and so for me, um, you know, that is very much to do with the, the question of what, what geometry has to, to, to do with God. Um, I just want to toss out a, one word here, which is the word occult. And there's a, a particular point of intersection in a triangle, uh, in a rectangle called the occult center. And you think, oh, occult, that means witchcraft. Witchcraft, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. But occult really means hidden from the eye. And so, you know, to, to me, it's like you might take a blank piece of paper, but there are points on that paper which are energetic points, points of illumination occult points. Um, and so that's just really um, a, a, a beautiful thing. Cosmos, I couldn't, uh, you know, I have to include this, this word here. Of course, cosmos comes from the Greek word uh, meaning um, ordered, cosmios, ordered, organized, decorous, of good behavior, orderly, well-prepared, well-ordered. Cosmos meaning relating to cosmetics, um, to adorn or to put something in, in order. And the basic meaning here is um, of a har harmonious arrangement or constitution. It denotes what is well assembled and constructed from individual parts. And this concept comes up over and over again in, in geometry. Um, early Greek literature actually referred to cosmos, uh, a, a meaning a, a culture or a city that was well ordered. Uh, by the time it, we got to Plato's day, it, it actually came to mean the universe, particularly a universe inherited by, by man, but cosmos, uh, when you think about it, its opposite is, its opposite is chaos uh, from order and, and chaos. And one of the Delphic maxims, actually it's the last one, it's kind of more like a poem, is very, very good and uses this, this word. And it goes, pais on cosmos isti. As a child, be well behaved, but be orderly, be Cosmios, ebon in krates. As a youth, show restraint. In krates has the word power in it. Have power over yourself. Uh, mesos dikaios. In the middle, be just. Presbutes eulogos. As an elder, be sensible. Presbutes the presbyters, the elders. You logos, you beautiful words. As an elder, say beautiful words. And teluton alugos, meaning reach the end without sorrow. And I just think that that's really beautiful that, that the, the word cosmos has to do not only with a beautiful universe, but living a beautiful, well-ordered life. Um, Harmony, we traditionally think of the word as having something to do with, with music, but there, there is harmony in, in what we see, what we hear, and what we know. Um, and all of these, these things are um, important. The musical analogy, which I do use a lot, is, is uh, very powerful of all of the ways of speaking about uh, harmony. And it's really important to, to understand that the early Greeks, there was a difference between somebody who was a harmonist or a harmonicist and somebody who was a musician. Uh, very different things that, and often combined, obviously, but being a musician and really understanding harmony were, were different things. Harmony being the union of contrary things, finding unity 
within multiplicity or accord within discord. Um, and you might say that God, a good definition is God is the arranger of discordant things. Uh, there, there is a, a consonance in, in numbers that would, can be found and revealed in, in numbers. Um, and obviously nature, uh, there's geometry in nature every way. And I could, I could go on and on about this. And I'm sure you can all see, see this. Uh, one of Critchlow's books is called The Hidden Geometry of, of Flowers. Uh, there's a book called The Curves of Life, where you see how various curves of the horns of an animal and the way the cosmos uh, is, is ordered. Um, so that, that the way that the universe is constructed with proportions between things, with natural phenomena, is evidence of the relatedness of things. We find a, a unity and order to things. Um, and it's also really sort of, you can say that a seed is a good example of things that exist as an idea or things that exist a priori. A seed has a, a little seed has a whole tree contain, contained in it. A little seed has teleological in, intention. And the shapes of plants are really the transformation of uh, invisible messages. Uh, it's a very interesting way to, to think about nature. Um, the word in Greek, harmotein, which is the uh, basis of the word harmony, actually um, means weaving or sewing together. Harmos means to join. Isn't that a wonderful concept? And music uh, is a symbol and a perfect metaphor for this idea of joining things together. As a matter of fact, uh, Plato says that in, in his uh, Republic, the philosopher alone is a musician. She who lives in harmony with reason is a musician. Uh, and there's also qualities of music that teach us about living a good life, uh, decency, cadence, accord between things. I put on this slide a very important um, uh, diagram, which is what they call the armature of a rectangle. And basically much of geometry is done just by drawing in diagonals and half diagonals. And you can see that there's these points where, where, where lines meet, right? You can almost feel them vibrating, energetic vibratory centers that will divide a rectangle into three, or well, obviously divided into two, but the two, three, four, or five. And I just want to, you know, kind of get that out there with it without going into the, the details. Um, a when I first started geometry, Mark would talk to me about different books on architecture and whatnot. And I thought, I, I just want to learn how, how to do some constructions. I want to make a Pentagon and an octagon. And I don't want to do architecture. I, whoever said I was in, but gradually, gradually, I get, I get sucked into architecture, um, how to creating sacred resonant harmonious spaces and all of the thinking particular that went on in earlier days with architecture. Um, one of the, the names that was really, really important in uh, the idea of harmony in architecture was a guy from the 1400s called Alberti. And he used the idea of consinitas Consinitas means harmony or elegance of design in the adaptation of parts to the whole and to each other. And you can even use this concept consinitas, the adaptation of parts to the whole in, in literary style. Um, and there's a, there's a notion that the mind recognizes consinitas instantly. The body feels consinitas. Uh, it, the consinitas is recognized the mind through the senses and is experienced as pleasure. Uh, in the late 1800s, there's a guy named Gustav Fechner that had people look at different rectangles and, and most people um, among six rectangles presented chose the golden rectangle, the golden 
the, the rectangle um, based on the golden mean. Uh, so where the where the parts have togetherness, um, and you know, it goes without saying that there that a lot a lot of what I'm talking about is sacredness of geometry. But geometry is just plain a practical tool. Um, you know, it, it was used in building before we had computers, before we really had paper and pencils widely available. And there's just there are many many. Uh, practical applications of it. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, the harmonia mundi, um, seeing that, that the, the, um, the harmony of, of the spheres. And I want to quote here, this is a great quotation from Ptolemy, who was a great harmonicist and did a lot of important work, uh, particularly in the the scale and, and how the scale was composed of number, it was around 127 uh, in the common era. And Ptolemy said, the natural consequence is that anyone who has practiced these calculations, if he retains any feeling for beauty, must be amazed at the power and beauty dwelling within harmonies. Yet this is something which also agrees completely with the calculations of the intellect and with the greatest precision discovers and produces the tunings in practical use. He will also be seized as it were by a holy yearning to behold and understand the true relationship in which this power stands to other phenomena in our world. So in other words, when you have a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you hear harmony, everything sounds like music. When you see harmony, everything looks like God. And I just like that idea that, that once you see, you say, like, oh my gosh, look at these numbers. When I put two and three together like this, it, it produces a beautiful sound. Um, you're seized by a holy yearning to find this everywhere you look. Um, Kayleen has talked uh, quite a bit about um, the healing power of music and uh, Pythagoras. And surely, we actually really don't know that much about Pythagoras. Uh, you, know, you just know, just sort of, just like Jesus. You just know what people said about Jesus. Uh, you know, you, you know what people believed in. And same with Pythagoras. Pythagoras... Um, was a great spiritual leader and indeed was a musician, probably a, a lyre player. Uh, and he talked about uh, that you should start your day upon waking with music. You prepare yourself for your daily tasks by having a well-tuned and harmonious attitude. Um, and so there's this, this notion that music can have a, a very healing beneficial effect. And the ancient Greeks thought, you know, you know, uh, the Dorian mode ha has healing, it's controlled by Apollo, but the Phrygian mode is like, no wonder you're in a bad mood. You started your day listening in the Phrygian mode, you know, or the, the med medieval times, they would, um, the doctor would say, dance three tarantellas and call me in the morning. They really, you know, it's like, you go out and like, instead of saying, take an aspirin, it's like, dance, dance a tarantella and you'll feel a lot better. Um, so, I mean, I certainly know math, math to me is very satisfying. Algebra, it's just satisfying. It works, it fits. There's a, just, um, you know, a, a really, really um, fun to do. And, and, you know, I've used it my, my whole life and, and I, I continue to. And actually, um, there is a, a, a a young romantic poet who was kind of, he, he died early, uh, but in, around the time of Goethe, who talked about algebra as a healing tool. And he said, your resolve to study algebra is certainly very healthy. The sciences have wonderful healing forces, at least like opium. They silence the pains and raise us into spheres permeated by an external sunlight. They are the most beautiful asylum to which we are granted access. And again, to answer the question before me, 
why do I say geometry? What does geometry have to do with God? It's this beautiful asylum to which it, it grants me access. Um, I could go on quite at length about um, geometry and artistic design. And so I'm just gonna put this out here. Again, that armature of the, of the rectangle, where if you are an artist, where are you going to put what on your painting? One of the artists um, in the Renaissance, uh, early Renaissance, I think, um, Piero della Francesca, uh, you can see here a grid that was placed on um, his, his painting, where, where, where did they put Jesus? Where did they put the Virgin Mary? What, what is the overall composition? And this one work that I did was kind of my attempt, that, which is in the center here, was my attempt to, this is the same painting as Piero della Francesca's uh, work in, in my own way of looking at it. I tried to put the, the harmonious points in uh, together. So the, the Greek word uh, for, for number is arithmos. And uh, I came up with a, a term, I call it homo arithmetos. In other words, homo sapiens, we could call ourselves that. We are the species that deals with numbers. Uh, Theon of Smyrna, an important thinker in this, this area said um, that um, number is actually at the root of reason. Without number, we don't have reason. Um, and and the, he said the animal doesn't, that doesn't know how to distinguish two from three, even from odd, will never be able to give reason to anything. So this was, and reading a lot of this work, it was kind of an aha moment for me. It's like, wow, they're really starting at the beginning. They're starting with even and odd. And if you think about it, understanding how even works and odd works is, is a really important uh, starting point. Um, and at the same time, they say, without number and reason, the soul of the animal is deprived of virtue. Um, Plato called arithmetic a gift of God, an epinomis. Um, and, and Theon of Smyrna said, numbers are the sources of form and energy in the world. You see on this page, I put uh, the, this, uh, the, the pebbles up there and I'll talk more about the Pythagorean tetractus, but this is what they call tsephoi uh, arithmetic, tsephoi meaning pebble. And so people started laying pebbles down and observing relationships and discerning the, the meaning in simple, simple things like this, even in odd triangular uh, diagrams. Um, Pythagoras in particular talked about the importance of small numbers and their relationships. And throughout Pythagorean and Platonic thinking, you know, they're, they're really trying to, to dig into relationships between small numbers, unity, the dyad, the triad, the tetrad. And the, their, the ratios between these small numbers are the basis of the scale, are the basis of a harmonic scale. So in other words, two, so the first one, if you have one, two, three, four, that's all you need and you can go really far. I can take two over one and that will give me an octave. I can take, the next one would be three over two, that would give me a perfect fifth. Four over three gives me a perfect fourth. Uh, and I, uh, did I say the octave? Yeah. And so, and from those, I'll get to get into this a little bit more. Um, you, you can construct the in, entire musical scale. Think of how much beauty <laughs> is, is created just from one, two, three, four. Um, and actually these, these numbers, what they tried to do, it got changed in later time, but they use what they called epimoric ratios. In other words, when the top number is one higher than the, the lower, three over two, four over three, two over one. Those are called epimorphic ratios. And they were really trying to answer things. But surely we should be able to explain it all with these simple, simple, simple ratios. Um, I also kind of included a, a, a diagram here of odd and even, which is uh, 
if you have the, the difference between an odd number and an even number, like you see the diagram on the left is square. If I want to create another square bigger in proportion than the first one, I have to put five pe pebbles down. So I have to put an odd number of pebbles down to recreate the square. The second one on the right, I started with an oblong, but I have to put an even number there. And so just, just things like that. It's like, that's kind of cool that, that things um, work that way. Even numbers and odd numbers are putting off very different energy. Um, my, this work that I put on the, the screen, it's a while ago already that I did it, but it's still one of my favorite uh, pieces, which I did, which is just, I just call this three, four, five. And the very cool thing about this is if you put a, uh, a triangle within a triangle, I'm gonna change my screen here, a tri triangle within a triangle and inscribe a circle in that, you get a certain size circle. And then if you put a square within a square within a square and you inscribe a circle in that, you get the exact same circle. And if you do a pentagram, with a pentagon in the middle of it and you inscribe a circle, you get the exact same circle. So there is that, that same circle. Um, and I just find that really amazing and beautiful. So this is where it's maybe not, not quite so sexy anymore, but it's extremely, extremely important, um, which is, is the, the, the word analogos, analogy meaning proportion. Analogos means proportionate, well-proportioned, suitable, in arithmetical progression, uh, in proportion to things. And it's really very, very similar to the word metaphor. Metaphor being based on metaferion, uh, to take, to carry beyond, fairy like, um, to carry beyond. And so a, 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 an analogy carries you further. A proportion carries you to the next step, brings, brings things together. And you might say an analogy is something that points beyond itself. Um, in other words, that's the way I think of it, that the, a thing that points to God, a thing that is in progression and proportion towards the whole the thing that points to unity. Um, and analogos is actually a, a quality of, of mind itself, a quality of, of consciousness. We only establish knowledge about something through its relation to something else. And the mind is an instrument of making analogical models. Actually, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, quotation here is, every part is disposed to unite with the whole, that it may thereby escape from its incompleteness. A beautiful thing. There is, and I, I included here um, on, on the top, it's, it's called the, the golden, golden spiral. Um, and it, this is a notion of the gnomon. And I think this really applies to an understanding of life. When I, in the golden rectangle, what's really great about it is when I, um, take a square off of the end of a golden rectangle, this very, very special, beautiful rectangle, I'm left with another golden rectangle, only smaller. And when I take a square off of that, I'm left with another golden rectangle, only smaller. So it's a perfect example of harmonious progression of, of movements. Now, Pythagoras, everybody knows the Pythagorean theorem, the, the um, uh, the, the straw man in, in Wizard of Oz said the sum of the square of the two sides equals this, this square of the hypotenuse. But the, the one theorem in geometry that doesn't get enough play is called the Thales theorem. And this thing in the bottom uh, shows what that is. And what it says is if you have a semicircle with two points A and B at the end, and you put a point anywhere on that semicircle and draw a line to points A and B, it will always form a perfect right angle. 
Um, and it's like, wow, that is really cool. And so much power in this in terms of geometry. If I drop the perpendicular down from that point C, now here's the cool thing, because I'm making a point about pro proportion and progression here. When I drop that line down, the triangle on the left and the triangle on the right, they're similar. They're the same triangle. One is twisted another way, but I can use that um, to, to create these, these wonderful proportions. Um, so that's really one of my, my favorite uh, things. Um, I talk, talking a little bit more about uh, proportion and, and polarity. Uh, we talked about um, the, the, the extremes or the opposites a, a little bit and dialectic really is something that breaks the bounds of, of polarity. Um, and the, the, the idea of there's thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Again, this creating unity out of, option, uh, out of opposites, a harmony. Um, and in, in the um, Pythagorean uh, table of opposites, there's some key, like 10, 10 opposites that are included there. And one of the most important is peras and apiron, meaning limit and unlimited. And at first I was like, wow, limit? Like, I don't like limits. Limit's not, not a nice word. But there's really a notion that the limit, it's limit that creates beauty. Uh, proportional limitations constrain the next possibility if it is to be harmonious. Uh, and so these, these proportions bring us kind of a relationship to, to unity and there's a mediation. And this is found you know, throughout geometry. Uh, unity would mean nothing without the opposites, you know, you, that, that the opposites are bringing that together. Now, as I've thought about uh, geometry and rectangles, at first I thought, oh, well, I'm gonna be a circle person for sure, because that's more you know, feminine way of approaching it. And, and my, 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 my teacher, Mark, was talking about rectangles and I slowly got into the, the beauty of, of rectangles. And there's this idea about the diagonal. You might say, well, I know what a diagonal is, right? You have a rectangle and it's the, the line that goes from one corner to the other. But the, really the, the word diagonal means, comes from the Greek word meaning across the knees. So what the diagonal does is it brings two distances together. It, it, you know, it's, so thinking, thinking of it, the diagonal is like a, a, a force that's holding two lengths together in a certain type of harmonious um, rectangle. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't comment here. This was a, a work that I did. These are what they call um, the uh, dynamic rectangles. In other words, you start with a square and then it goes, the next one is called a square root of two, which is composed, it's, its side equals the length of the diagonal of the square. And then the diagonal of the square root of two is the next rectangle, which is the square root of three, square root of four, which equals two, square root of five. And the, the cool thing is, is like, again, I'm trying to make a point about things which are the same, but either smaller or bigger. So there's a way of geometrically finding on each of these, you see there's a series of little rectangles at the bottom. Those rectangles are, are easily found. Um, I just wanna make a point here in this page about means. We talked about that, that beautiful uh, word before about means. Um, life, basically, what does it mean? It's a number, numbers that are between two other numbers. And but there's certain, in geometry, there's certain numbers that are more meaningful. And I'm not going to, to go into that, but the arithmetic mean is a number, a certain calculation between two other numbers, which equals uh, the perfect fifth. And the harmonic mean, which is calculating in a certain way, equals the perfect fourth. Without the perfect fourth and without the perfect fifth, we would not have Western harmonics. Um, and so Pythagorean music theory is really centered around this concept of means, this finding these, these, these beautiful numbers that are, are between other numbers. Um, the 
Pythagorean tetractus actually uh, is, is a diagram that was used that you can lay out. If you look at the, the numbers along the left side, goes one, two, four, eight, they double. And then the other side, one, three, nine, 27, and they, they triple. And the relationship between these numbers uh, and the way they move back and forth allows you to find the Western harmonic scale. I talked about that already. Um, one of the, the things that Pythagoras um, was said to say was, I swear by the one who has bestowed the tetractus to the coming generations, the source of eternal nature into our souls, that they really saw a, a lot in that. And actually the, the tetrachord, the fourth, da, 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 like that, that interval was the basis of the first scales and the first lyres had only seven strings. And then Pythagoras came up with the idea of adding a note in between. So you have a fourth and then add a note between and another fourth and you form a, a whole octave. And these wonderful uh, arithmetic relationships are, are produced from that. Um, I just have to kind of uh, bang the drum here a little bit about couple of my favorite numbers, six, eight, nine, and 12. And it's out of six, eight, nine, and 12 that uh, is a really good explanatory value of, of the scale and the harmonious scale. Um, if you say the relationship between six and eight, we talked before about the epimoric ra ratios, has a ratio of three to four. The relation between nine and 12 is three to four. Six to nine is two to three and eight to 12 is two to three. So I can, you know, I can jump with just these, these ratios, I can jump to a fifth and then I jump up to an octave. And as a matter of fact, you, you see, we've seen the School of Athens painting where we, you know, Pythagoras is there and he's got a little diagram. And I put up there the, um, this other diagram where you can see what is said in that. And at the top, it says Epogduan. Epogduan is this note, this difference between the eight and the nine, nine over, over eight, uh, which allows us to get to the whole note. And once you have the whole note, you can put your whole scale together. And then he goes in, you can see these words, diatessaron is the perfect fourth, and diapente is the perfect fifth, diapason is the, is the um, octave. Now here uh, to kind of make my, my point, um, I was seized by the holy yearning uh, that uh, Ptolemy talked about. I created something here called Ptolemy's Helicon. And this is another way of like, what you see, what you think, what you hear, it's all of the same thing. So there's a way of dividing a square so that, and this thing in the middle is, it, it shows you if, if you have a string of this length, it will give you the fourth, a string of another length, which is perfectly easy to find, and another length, give you the fourth, the fifth, and the octave. And I tried to take that and I uh, created an art, artwork out of it. Um, so that's a perfect way of, of making that point. Um, the, this page, I just don't mean to freak you out with numbers here, but all I wanna say here is the entire diatonic scale is made out of combinations of twos and threes. I'm hammering this home. All of these things are, are made by, you know, two to the third power, two to the fifth power, two over three to the fourth power, et cetera. So these, these numbers come out and you can have this, this, this whole scale. And that is essentially, you know, what, what Plato uh, gave us. Again, I'm always trying to relate this to, to my, my artwork. Um, and this was a way of saying, if I take uh, three halves times four thirds, it's gonna equal 12 sixths, which is double, which is a octave. So what do I have to do to a diapente, to a certain rectangle of relation to that has a dimension of three to two, I add one on each side and the, so the rectangles grow. It's a little bit hard to describe the details, but again, it's just my attempt to make a picture of it so I, I really um, under, understand it better. Now here, I took um, Thales' theorem where I, I put these, these rectangles um, 
I tried to find these rectangles and I put them on the, the circle using Thales theorem. So the, you see there the root note, let's think of that the red box on the left is a square. The whole tone has a ratio of nine to eight. Um, and that's what that looks like as a rectangle. And the perfect fourth, a little squattier, perfect fifth looks a certain way and the octave is, is, is a double, double square. So this was very, and you can see then down in the lower left corner, um, I placed them on the circle so you could see these things. So it's, it's just a way of, of um, finding these sounds visually. In a, in a diagram. And actually uh, Goethe was known to say, geometry is, is frozen music. Um, at the bottom of the tetractus that I talked about earlier, um, there were several numbers, 8, 12, 18, and 27. And that was the last part of the tetractus. Now this was my attempt, I took eight, times, I call this a triple diapente or a singing sesquialtera. Don't have time to explain the words, but each number is multiplied by one and a half to get you a fifth. And then it, 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 the next number is multiplied by one and a half. So eight times one and a half is 12. 12 times one and a half is 18. 18 times one and a half is 27. And this is my interpretation of what it might look like. A singing rectangle. Can, can't you hear it? Um, and these have a lot of um, uh, symbolism in medieval thinking, as a matter of fact. Um, suffice it to say, again, I talked earlier about geometry as having practical application. And, you know, like uh, the, uh, the design of a Greek vase, for example, it uses certain proportions. This piece to that piece goes with, in certain proportions. Everything in nature uses different proportions and there's ways of analyzing that. This is just a way of kind of um, sharing with you some, some of those diagrams. I wouldn't go, go into it. Um, just a little bit of, of you know, the, the sim simple geometry you can see. It was funny when I first started geometry, um, I thought, God, I, I can't even make a square. I think somebody in kindergarten could make a square, but it really isn't as easy as it, as it, as it seems. But, you know, that just, you get an idea just by looking at this, some of the techniques that a geometer would use to put together a square. Again, I mentioned how the equilateral triangle was found in the Vesica Piscus, the intersection of two circles. Um, it's totally amazing that the radius of a circle, you know, when you use that radius, you create six equilateral triangles and it goes around and will create a perfect hexagon. I mean, if that isn't wonderful, I don't know what is. Um, here is an example of how an octagon is made and there's something called the sacred cut. So in other words, if I have a square and I took my compass and I put it from the corner to the center of that square and then I scribe that up, that's how I will make an octagon. And I will tell you that I, um, I stay away from octagons because I find them very addicting. <laughs> They're just really fun. There's so many things you can do with that. And of course, pentagons are, are more difficult, but they're, they're extremely beautiful. And it's just important to note here that we've talked a little bit about the golden rectangle or the golden mean that the number five and the golden mean are intimately related, intimately bound up with each other. And as a matter of fact, the ratio between various sides of a star or pentagram are exactly, you can see this kind of example here of this, if this distance is phi is used to talk about the golden mean, if this distance is phi and this is one, you'll find that all over the place. And this number I could probably give a, whole separate talk on, on the golden mean 1.618. But basically it means, um, you know, if, if you see the example here, if I take the relation of AB to AC, um, uh, it, it, it equals 1.618, which is the same as AC to the whole. There's only one number in the universe. Um, that is like that is like that. So it carries a lot of power. It's really wonderful. Um, 
just to talk a little, I, I'm not going to talk much about um, the symbolism of numbers because there's a lot there and that's not so much my thing, but, you know, there's a, a you know, a one symbolizes unity, a two symbolizes duality, the three symbolizing synthesis, etc. Et um, and that each number can seem can be seen to be um, an archetype in itself. It holds its own power. It holds its own lessons that, that come with it. Um, of course, the number, I mean, pick, pick like what's your favorite number, um, but, but four is, is pretty, pretty darn wonderful number. And um, Theon of Smyrna, great Platonist scholar, talked about 11 quaternaries. 11 combinations of four, and I think these are important to mention. Point, line, surface, solid. The four elements, fire, air, water, earth. Uh, the ages of man, the four temperaments, the four winds, mankind, family, village, city, thought, science, opinion, feeling, the seasons, spring, summer, winter, fall, um, and so there's really a, a lot of, of power in that. And each one of the numbers in what they call the decad, the first 10 numbers, there's a, a whole body of thought around, um, you know, wh what, what, they, what the numbers might mean. Uh, this was, I took a class on the Cosmati pavement at Westminster Abbey, and which of course is very beautiful mosaic work. Uh, but the class that I took explained how a medieval person looking at this would know exactly what it meant and what each part represented. And so this was not only did I get to learn how to do, you know, how to how to do the geometry, but I included in here, these are the numbers for 8, 12, 18, and 27, which would be relating to the four elements. And in, in the center, of course, it's it's um, God or 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 unity. Um, this is the, the last sl slide here, which to me is a, an important slide, um, where I took a course um, with this man named David Kranswick with the Prince's School, and um, I was blown away. Everything he said, I was like, oh, he, this, the, here is a, a true Platonist that is really into this, and he talked about craft. And one of the quotes from him I really loved was, the tools of the artist act as divine instruments through which the face of eternity is revealed within the darkness of, of matter. Um, you know, there the, again, the idea that techne, that it's a craft and it's not just scrapbooking or going to Michael's or whatever, it kind of gives new, new meaning to, to the word craft and, and Cranswick used it in an almost uh, mystical way that there's philosophy behind these ancient craft traditions. Um, and, and he talked about craft as a discipline. You cannot bypass the journey. You really have to do the, the work. The craft is, is repetitive. It stills the mind. Um, in, in, remember Gandhi, when he talked about this with spinning. A spinning as a repetitive action that leads to a meditative state of mind. It's a losing of the e ego and where skills can take you to a deeper level and, and ready the mind to receive the imagination. Um, that, that the craft itself is a sacred process. And something that is talked about at the Prince's School and, and that Kranswick uh, emphasized was this idea about head, heart, hand. So that when those three things are working together, when you make things with your hands, you really start to, to learn a lot. And it's, it's not just an oral tradition, it's where the, 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 um, the teaching comes through the practices that themselves. And uh, there's a idea that the whole body is, is covered in eyes. Uh, that it's it's through our hands that we're able to make this extraordinary journey. And the mind is in the body and the body is in the mind. 
and the inner is outer and the outer is, is inner. And so we do so much with our hands that opens up this, this consciousness within, within the body. Uh, you know, for me, geometry comes as, as a ritual, uh, turning this action into prayer, a type of concentration, a kind of letting go. Um, there's a really, really wonderful word, which is the word poyain. And you think, oh, well, that must be the root of po poetry. But it also means in Greek to make or create. And I thought to myself, how wonderful that the word that's related to poetry means to make. Um, and so, you know, again, geometry is being kind of a, uh, a way to, to make, make things which carries with it its own kind of uh, poetry uh, where you empty your mind uh, and, and make it perfect. Um, you know, one thing that Kranswick said, there's a certain amount of, I try to tell people it's not necessarily relaxing. I'm not talking about relaxation because I get very stressed out when, when I work and it's, but it's good stress energy. It's not bad stress energy. It's, uh, it's, it's energetic. Um, and it's the kind of thing that makes you want to do it right and makes you want to go further and makes you want to make it make it perfect. Um, and Kranswick also talked about um, tools. And, you know, I should have had my, my, my compasses and everything out because the tools are sacred. Um, Kranswick says you should bow down to your brushes. My teacher, Mark, says, you know, you say a prayer. You praise your brushes. You, and, and Mark also uh, says, before you start to draw, you, you breathe. You know, you become very conscious of, of what you're doing. Um, so what the quotation from Kranz book that I really liked was, the tools of the artist act as divine instruments through which the face of eternity is revealed within the darkness of matter. Uh, they are not just instruments, but these are things, these are vehicles through which we participate in a more primordial world. So um, I will stop there and I will stop the recording as well.